Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar on aphasia rehabilitation. My name is Aliana Ortu, and before we get started, I'd like to introduce our presenters. First, we have Dr. Patrick Coppins, who's a full professor in the Department of Communication Disorders and Sciences at SUNY Plattsburgh, where he teaches graduate neurogenics courses. Dr. Coppins has 20 years of experience teaching and conducting research in the area of aphasia. He has published and presented extensively in his area of expertise. Dr. Coppins is also a member of ASHA Special Interest Group 2 and a member of the Executive Board of the Academy of Neurologic Communication Disorders and Sciences. Dr. Janet Patterson is the Chief of Audiology and Speech Language Pathology Service for the VA Northern California Healthcare System. She was formerly a faculty member at California State University, East Bay, and is currently a lecturer in the Department of Communicative Sciences and Disorders. Dr. Patterson is also an ASHA Fellow, a member of ASHA Special Interest Group 2, and a member of the Executive Board of the Academy of Neurologic Communication Disorders and Sciences. So at this point, I'd like to turn things over to our presenters. Yes, hi, this is Patrick Coppins. Nice to uh, be with you. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, what I would like to do is to introduce you to our book that we're going to talk about during this hour. And I would like to start by telling you a little bit about how we came about uh, the idea for the, for the text. Essentially, no matter how, how well you're prepared to provide therapy to individuals with aphasia, there will be instances, and probably most of you have experienced that, where you say, what, what do I do now? How do I deal with this? And essentially, um, Janet and I had a conversation like that during a national convention recently, and um, we asked ourselves, what are these uh, symptoms or features of the clinical process that clinicians are, you know, regularly faced with and that they may not be fully prepared for? And essentially, based on our own clinical and classroom experiences, we wanted to fill that gap. And we wanted to provide students and clinicians with information that would be really clinically useful, uh, but that was not typically covered in detail anywhere else. And that was essentially the genesis of the book. And indeed, the majority of the topics uh, in the book have never appeared as a separate uh, um, topic in, in a chapter format before. So I hope that's all going to be useful to a lot of clinicians and uh, students. So after we came up with a list of topics, um, Janet and I looked for a logical way to organize this list, and we noticed that we had simply two different types of things. Uh, on the one hand, we had true aphasia symptoms, and on the other hand, we had a list of treatment features that are not uh, aphasia uh, characteristics, but that definitely contribute to how you organize uh, your therapy, your rehabilitation approaches. And this is exactly how we decided to uh, structure the text. The first half of the text uh, deals with true aphasia symptoms, and the second part with essential uh, therapy features. Now that we had the structure of the book and we had identified each topic, we contacted the best possible uh, chapter authors, and that is we wanted to uh, invite individuals who were both excellent researchers and master clinicians. And lo and behold, they all said that they loved the project and they agreed to collaborate, and uh, these authors actually span the globe. We have people from uh, Germany, Portugal, New Zealand, Canada, Britain, and the U.S., of course. And we asked them to generate a chapter with heavy emphasis on, on clinical relevance, but with evidence-based support for their conclusions. And indeed, each chapter has very concrete clinical applications, but with a strong theoretical support or evidence-based practice. Uh, to make the chapters a little uh, more uh, dynamic, uh, Janet and I asked that each chapter include a fictitious case illustration, and the purpose of that was to provide a, a, a real-life example, a concrete example of the decision-making process, the linear decision-making process, and to highlight the important clinical conclusions uh, of the chapter. So allow me to talk to you briefly about the first part of, of, this, um, of this text. Uh, that's the part that deals with uh, specific uh, aphasia symptoms. 
So the, for example, the topic of uh, perseveration and paraphasias are treated as separate topics, uh, each in a chapter rather than under the larger umbrella of naming therapy like it's usually done. Um, treating these issues separately uh, allowed the authors to describe clinical strategies very specific to each, each topic. So in the first, if you look at the first three chapters, uh, Jackie and Mike and Jane, uh, offered uh, very clinical um, uh, approaches and programs to minimize the occurrence of perseverations, paraphasias, and neologisms, respectively. Just to give you one uh, quick example, uh, one program uh, to, um, for uh, perseverations, to reduce perseverations, is called Reducing Aphasic Perseverations. It's been described um, first by uh, Maria Munoz. and. And the, the program uh, progressively reduces time intervals between uh, presentations of pictures during naming, and that tends to help uh, the patients reduce the occurrence of perseverations. Um, in Chapter 4, uh, Yasmin and, and uh, Angie uh, did the same thing for a grammatism. They present strategies and programs specifically designed to improve a grammatism. Uh, as an example, again, uh, something called mapping therapy uh, that they describe and, and, um, and clinically focuses on, on the verb argument structure and facilitates the production of more complete sentences by including all the elements that the verb uh, demands. Uh, so the last two chapters, uh, echo phenomena and, and neurogenic stuttering, are a little bit less frequent uh, as symptoms, but usually when, when the clinicians encounter those, they have a very hard time figuring out what to do. So uh, in this case, for the chapter on echo phenomena, uh, Marcelo focuses uh, on the transcortical aphasias and offers not only strategies to inhibit repetition or echolalia when that is needed, but he also interestingly uses repetition. He, he discusses the use of repetition as a rehabilitation tool. And uh, Luke and his colleague um, argue in their chapter that uh, neurogenic stuttering is uh, more frequent than clinicians think, and they present a very interesting and thorough assessment battery that is very useful clinically. And of course, they also make clinical recommendations um, and these recommendations actually, interestingly, also have similarities with what, what happens during uh, therapy for developmental fluency problems. So that's for the, uh, the, the first part of challenging symptoms, and I will let Janet talk to you about the second part of the book that deals with uh, clinical challenges and uh, treatment components. Janet? Thank you, Patrick, and I would like to say welcome and thank you also to everyone who's joining us this afternoon. In the second part of the book, we, as Patrick mentioned, thought about um, important elements of the therapy enterprise, um, pieces that are not specific to disorders themselves, but are important to balancing and creating good therapy um, uh, treatment programs and um, working with clients uh, collaboratively. In these chapters, we begin with um, one on generalization um, in which Patrick and I talk about um, how we can actively facilitate that generalization. We know that that's the ultimate goal of therapy. That is what people want to do, but often it's left until later in the game, and I think Patrick and I believe that we should be planning for generalization from the beginning. And in this chapter, we talk about the different kinds of generalization and specific things uh, one can do in therapy to facilitate the generalization. Sarah Wallace um, speaks nicely in her chapter on multimodal strategies that uh, facilitate communication. While we all know about AAC, um, we don't always know how to maximize it in everyday clinical practice, and I think some of Sarah's suggestions will be welcomed by um, uh, clinicians working with patients with aphasia. Treatment intensity, the third chapter um, by myself and two colleagues, Stacey Raymer and Leora Cherney, 
Uh, we've, you must have heard or may have heard a lot about intensity in recent months. And certainly the treatment intensity or the dosage can affect the therapy outcome. But what we don't know so much about is how do we determine the best intensity for the best treatment. And one of the interesting things that this chapter does is look at intensity from multiple perspectives. And if we vary one aspect of the dosage, what happens to the overall intensity level and the uh, patient outcomes? And if we instead vary in a different way, how do the outcomes change? Jackie Hinckley wrote a chapter um, about combining therapy approaches, specifically combining neuropsychological and psychosocial goals in a coherent rehabilitation approach. approach. Her point is that when we work collaboratively, collaboratively with a patient and when we think about the goals that the patient wishes to achieve, then we're better at selecting the treatments that will achieve that goal than if we follow a linear sort of path in selecting treatments that address individual goals, but perhaps not the uh, overall functional goals of a patient. By now, everyone should be somewhat familiar with evidence-based practice. Yet the application of that in clinical practice still can be vague for many clinicians. And in the chapter on evidence-based practice, Patrick and I offer some practical advice on how to do that, how to consider all three points of the evidence-based practice triangle. Also in this chapter, we consider broader issues of evidence-based practice, such as um, evidence-based practice and justice. How do we represent people who are um, outside the, um, at the ends of the continuum or outside the norms, if you will, of uh, communication functioning. The last, uh, next chapter is on motivation. And intuitively, we all believe that a patient motivation is important to therapy success, but we're rarely taught the strategies to maximize this. And often we find clinicians will say the patient uh, has plateaued because they're not motivated. Mike Beale and his colleagues present a very thoughtful uh, theoretical review of this particular problem and then concrete advice about how to identify specific motivational challenges for patients and actions we can take as clinicians to improve the motivation of a patient as we engage collaboratively in treatment. And the last chapter by Patrick and Nina Simmons Mackey focuses on informal testing, which is the intermediate step between formal standardized testing and therapy. Nina and Patrick dissected this process and described a practical way of analyzing and applying it to patients with aphasia. In the rest of this webinar, we're going to focus on two of these topics in the second half of the book, generalization and dosage and intensity. And I'll turn it over to Patrick. Yes, thank you, Janet. I'm going to talk about generalization and physiology. Unfortunately, of course, we don't have time to go in depth in all the chapters in the book. But so we, like Janet said, we selected two to um, delve a little bit more in detail in in the literature. And um, and generalization, I think, is one, was one of the important ones in in the book. So we selected that one. Like Janet said, generalization is the ultimate goal of our of our therapy. That's that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to establish a behavior, and then hopefully that the the, uh, the behavior generalizes. But unfortunately, we don't really know how to do that very well. And Stokes and Bear, a long time ago. Uh, labeled it train and hope. So we do therapy, we train, and then we hope for the best. And so that's an acknowledgement that we really don't know how to do generalization very well. What we know, though, is that, of course, generalization is entirely dependent on the success of the treatment. So if the treatment is successful, there is a possibility, a probability even, of generalization. Um, and if the treatment is not successful, it's not going to happen, uh, the, the, which is another way of saying that the treatment effect is usually quantitatively uh, larger than the generalization effect. 
Another thing to keep in mind about generalization is that generalization is not automatic. Train, uh, if we do the training and we hope for generalization, uh, it's not going to necessarily work. It's not an automatic thing. Um, and so we have to plan for it, like Janet said. In, in terms of um, whether generalization happens or not, we know that, and, and this has been shown by group studies in the literature, if the treatment works for the group of patients, let's say 10 patients, you will see generalization in some patients but not in others, or better generalization in some patients and, and less, less so in others. So what is, what is causing that? Well, the, the short answer is we don't know. But we do know that there is an individual variability and that there are probably many factors that come into play. And some of these factors are hypothesized, of course, like I said, we don't really know. But the uh, aphasia type, aphasia severity may play a part. The level of cognitive skills, executive functions may play a part. The level of motivation, the amount of practice that was provided the dosage of the treatment that was provided, the number of items that were trained, et cetera, those are just some of the possible uh, factors in that individual variability. Generalization also is not unitary. Um, essentially, there are two types that have been recognized. Response generalization is the type of generalization to similar types of things, so similar exemplars from a from a, a, a lexical unit to other lexical units or from a type of sentence to other types of sentences. And so that's, general, that's response generalization. On the other hand, stimulus generalization is generalization to other people, other settings, uh, to discourse, for example. So um, to make matters even more difficult, these two types of generalization uh, are independent and they require, uh, they both require our attention and then the same strategies may not work for both. We may actually have to develop strategies for, for uh, each of those types. This is essentially a, a, a brief a summary of what we discuss in the book, what Janet and I discuss in the book, and I'm just going to give you in a couple of sentences our conclusions for each of these strategies that we that we found. So for response generalization now, uh, we looked at training verbs. So when you train verbs in uh, therapy as an isolated lexical unit, that does not work well. It does not facilitate response generalization, just like it doesn't with isolated uh, nouns. Now training items in a sentence context works uh, better. Uh, interventions, for example, such as Zenest, um, verb network strengthening treatment, originally described by Edmonds, you know, shows a better response generalization to other verbs and actually to some untrained nouns, which is very interesting. Uh, treating more complex items. Uh, what does that mean? It means that according to the complexity account of treatment efficacy, or Kate, uh, uh, described by Cindy Thompson, um, it, it has shown good results for syntax and for naming. And the idea is that if you focus on more difficult items, they tend to uh, generalize to simpler items, but not the other way around. And, and this uh, has been shown to work for syntax, like I said, and for for naming as well, um, uh, Swati Kiran uh, did the research for the naming. Unfortunately, it generalizes only within the same types of syntactic structures and within the same category of naming items, so it's not a, 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 an overall generalization. Uh, treating the underlying mechanism, so that means focusing therapy on a more central language production process, a more central node in, in the chain of events, tends to increase the chance of generalization, uh, for example, to other modalities. Uh, the same way it happens uh, when you're focusing on a process like the, the skill of naming, the naming process, rather than a specific task in therapy, such as naming 10 things. So that's, again, good results uh, for that. 
using the loose, tra loose training approach. This refers to the notion that uh, you are varying slightly the stimuli and the responses to, to um, include some kind of, of, of change, small change from one exemplar to the next. Um, and there, there, unfortunately, there are not a lot of data on this, but overall the generalization results tend to be better than just simply drilling the, sim the, the same item the same way over and over again. Uh, one example is a response elaboration training, RET, that Kevin Kearns uh, devised a, 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 while, a while back. So that's a good example of such an approach. Internalizing the strategy, no doubt that uh, any strategy that the patient applies more readily to a wide array of items will uh, show better generalization than when the patient has to rely on item-specific responses. And um, a semantic feature analysis, SFA, is a good example in, in, this, uh, in this strategy, uh, the, the uh, SSA by Mary Boyle originally. And finally, training enough exemplars. Um, quantity itself is not a good variable. Um, it, it, it has to be paired with, with an effective approach. Uh, so if, if, you, if you have an effective approach, then, then it's going to work. But just make, doing the same thing over again, just quantity-wise, quantity is, not, is not a good uh, strategy. So that was for response generalization. Now let's switch to stimulus generalization, so the generalization to other people, other settings, or discourse. And the strategies that we were reviewing are, again, trained verbs. What happens when you train verbs in isolation? Not much. Um, the same as for response generalization, training verbs in isolation uh, does not promote stimulus generalization in discourse, for example. Now, training items in a sentence context, on the other hand, works better. Um, it's a better option for discourse generalization, also, although, uh, to be fair, a discourse level practice is needed uh, to, uh, to establish this generalization as well. Uh, adding discourse or conversational training. Um, it's, it's pretty obvious, and it has positive results. But um, the clinician has to spend some time building intermediary steps between the therapy room and other conversation partners or other situation. Um, a, a broad generalization uh, just by adding discourse or conversation training in the therapy room does not automatically guarantee a, a generalization. So there are, the, the, the therapist of the SLP has to build a series of intermediary steps. Uh, what those steps are exactly, we don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples a, a little bit later, but uh, we don't have an exhaustive list, unfortunately. Uh, treating more complex items, again, works well, uh, but we only have data for syntax. Uh, there are no data for, for naming in this particular instance. Um, but for syntax, um, it, it tends to improve uh, patient's discourse. So when you treat more complex items, there is a generalization to, to discourse. The, the patients tend to, tend to use uh, more of those sentences in discourse. Treating the underlying mechanism, this approach uh, works uh, just as well for stimulus generalization uh, than for uh, response generalization. And this may actually be one of the few approaches that works equally well for both types of, of generalization. Uh, using loose training, again, it's an, this is maybe one example of those steps that I was talking about a minute ago. So it, 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 may, be, it may be facilitating stimulus generalization because it reflects more the variability of a more natural interaction. Um, uh, so in isolation, it's probably not going to do it, but as, that it, as, as one of the intermediary steps between the therapy room and the other environments of other people, that, that might work well. Um, so you need, you need to use another approach with this one, like uh, internalization of a strategy or uh, targeting the appropriate underlying mechanism, for example.
adding home practice, again, we've been doing this for, for years, um, but like I said before, more is, is less crucial than how the home program is run. Uh, so the clinician should use home practice as an opportunity not not only for more practice, but also for adding, for example, something like loose train a loose training component uh, that will be very useful. Um, as an example, in this particular case, um, the um, the constraint induced aphasia therapy of CIAT uh, recently added to their program what they call a transfer package. Um, that's their label, and that focuses essentially on the work that is done outside the therapy room, so they really emphasize that part. So that's a good example here. Uh, using functional items, again, we've been doing this for years, um, and uh, there is no doubt that it's useful, um, but it, again, needs to be interpreted as, as another bridge, as another intermediary step uh, between the therapy room and the successful uh, stimulus generalization. So that's it for the generalization chapter, um, and now Janet is going to address the, another of the chapters in, in the book, Treatment Intensity. Janet? Thank you, Patrick. So we all know and believe that um, selecting an appropriate treatment technique and determining patient candidacy for that treatment are important to our success, but what we find um, is that clinical research remains largely silent on how do we do that and how do we think about the best match of the patient, the treatment type, the dosage, and the intensity of treatment. We don't have answers uh, at this point, but we are gathering a lot of evidence. And in fact, there are an increasing number of studies in, uh, that look at the intensity of treatment delivered. One of the systematic reviews recently reported modest but mixed evidence, um, a fa um, evidence favoring intensive treatment. However, when you look more closely at that, there are many factors and, uh, that influence the intensity and there are also variabilities, uh, there is variability among patients. So when we think about our clinical research, we can compare our patients to patients in the research literature, matching them based upon their demographics and determine patient candidacy. But what we haven't done a lot uh, of is matching dosage and intensity of the program. If you think about your own particular client, you can line your client up with against the uh, clients, the patients, participants in a model research program, a model treatment program, and determine that your patient meets all the demographic characteristics, but what about the, the uh, program delivery characteristics? Can your program, for example, match the dosage and the intensity of the model treatment program? And if so, that's great, but if not, um, then that says that we must do some adjustment in uh, how we're thinking about the, the treatment that we're delivering in any particular situation. So all of this is leading to questions, and I said we have more questions than we have answers at this point. How do we define intensity? And it might seem an easy uh, term to define, but once you begin looking beneath the surface, it's not so easy. Do we think about it in terms of hours per day, or is it number of days per week? Um, there is no consistent definition of high versus low intensity. Randy Roby published a number of years ago a paper and spoke that, uh, wrote that anything over two hours of therapy or five hours of therapy a week is intensive. Another paper came along a few, later, few years later by Bogle et al. and showed that it's eight hours of therapy. So we don't know exactly what is high intensity or low intensity treatment. So if we don't know, how do we compare? Many of the studies only evaluate one level of intensity or intensive treatment. If there's on, only one level, then we don't know how affect how the uh, intensity affects the treatment and, and the outcome. You must have two levels of intensity to really understand what that influence is on a treatment outcome. And there aren't too many studies that have actually delivered the very same treatment 
under two different conditions of intensity. And those studies have shown uh, mixed results. So how do we think about intensity um, versus dosage in respect to our own clinical uh, environments? A few years ago, Warren, Fay, and Yoder published a study examining just this question, treatment intensity and treatment dosage. This paper was focused on child language, but the ideas in it are applicable to all sorts of treatment. And the analogy is that it is medication dosage. You're given a medication in a certain amount of dosage in a certain schedule with the expectation that if you follow that dosage schedule, you will achieve a desired outcome. That's the way that Warren, Fay, and Yoder have looked at treatment dosage in um, speech language pathology. But I assume you can immediately see the challenges to using that analogy um, because we aren't looking at single little medications that can be delivered in a very prescribed dosage. So what Warren, F.A., and Yoder have tried to do is um, define dosage as best they could. And here is the, the, the list of dose, or definitions that you, um, you can see on the screen. This is the, these are the terms that will take the most amount of, of thought uh, as you prepare to calculate the intensity of your treatment. What is your general approach or your, your specific technique? That would be like our uh, response elaboration training or, or semantic feature analysis or whatever a general approach you're using. Then you define what's called the teaching episode. And it, a teaching episode, it contains one or more intervention acts that you have believe, you, you believe um, will change a behavior and achieve a goal. So if the patient engages in this intervention act, something will happen neurologically, resulting in behavioral change and goal achievement. Then you have to define the active ingredient in the treatment. And that's not so easy, because much of it is about the processes that we believe, presume, um, are going to occur to enhance new learning. Those processes, an example, would be um, improving semantic relatedness. Now, we can't actually measure that, um, and we can't really focus on what the exact active ingredient is, but as part of our thinking to calculate intensity, we must be aware of what we think is going to happen during the time we're doing the treatment. And then dose form is the typical task within which we deliver these particular teaching episodes. Using those definitions, then, we can begin to calculate treatment dosage. And the first number we need to know is the dose, which is defined as the number of properly administered teaching episodes during a single intervention session. So for example, if you're using a queuing procedure, you decide you're going to do 20 queuing episodes during a 20-minute uh, session with the patient. Then we calculate dose frequency, which is the number of times a dose or intervention act is delivered uh, per unit of time. So we believe that, in this example, there will be two 20-minute sessions per week of this particular queuing episode. And that might occur, say, within a 50-minute session, 20 minutes of it spent on this queuing uh, treatment and the other uh, uh, 30 or more minutes spent on um, other activities. And then you calculate the total intervention uh, duration, which is how long the uh, 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 intervention occurs, in this case, eight weeks. Then it becomes a simple matter of mathematics to calculate what's called the cumulative intervention intensity. It's the dose times the dose frequency times the total intervention. And in th this example, it is 20 times 2 times 8. The value of 320 refers to the number of doses of your treatment that the client has received in this therapy program. So they've received 320 doses of the queuing episode. The next step is then to compare that dosage with um, the dosage with the outcome. So what is your outcome of what is the outcome of your particular client and your treatment, compare that with the outcome of the model treatment. Are the dosages similar? Are the outcomes similar? 
or are they different? And then more about that in a moment. There's another way we can look at dosage, and that's using the therapeutic intensity ratio. This ratio has been devised for the intensive comprehensive aphasia programs, and there are several of them throughout the country. Um, an intensive comprehensive aphasia program operates for a number of days a week. Um, the therapeutic intensity ratio is based on the concept of there are 40 hours available in a work week, a typical work week. So you calculate the number of therapy hours per day times the number of days in the week the therapy is delivered, divide that by 40. In this example, five hours of therapy a day times four days a week divided by 40 is a point, leads to 0.5 TIR. So if my intensive therapy program is 0.5 TIR, and your therapy, intensive therapy program is 0.8 TIR, in the concept of the 40 hours of the treatment program, you're delivering more treatment than, than I am. The idea is to compare um, the dosage calculations, whether it's a cumulative intervention intensity or therapeutic intensity ratio, compare that to the model treatment. Um, and that we do that in order to set expectations. And so if your treatment program cannot meet the um, expectations uh, or cannot meet the uh, dosage of the model treatment, then the outcomes will likely be different. And if that's the case, it's something we have to consider and then something needs to be adjusted. Maybe if we're having a, a, a smaller dosage, we have to expect um, a less of an outcome than if we were able to deliver a larger dosage of, of treatment. So in summary, although you had a, a high level view of generalization and, and dosage and intensity, uh, Patrick and I believe that aphasia rehabilitation has progressed in so many important ways, although many, many, many questions remain. And as Patrick said earlier in this uh, webinar, some of those are not addressed in graduate studies. Other of these questions are contemporary topics that emerge as we become better clinicians and as our field accumulates more knowledge. So we hope that this review and this text will be of value to you as you address these questions in your daily practice. Here's a list of the references that we um, included on our slides that you can cite or look up at your leisure. On behalf of Patrick and myself, we thank you for your attention and your time today, and we'll turn it back over to Aliana. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Patrick, as well. That was a great presentation. At this point, I want to invite our participants to ask a question either live or via the chat box. And while we wait for that, we did have one question that came in through the chat, just asking kind of a general question about the most difficult aspect you find about rehabilitation for students or even new clinicians. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. We have to pick one that's most difficult. <laughs> if you can. Speaking for myself, I, I think it is the exercise in figuring out what is the best match of treatment for this particular patient in this particular situation. Um, and sometimes a treatment seems like it's perfectly tailored for the particular problem, but when you talk to the client about it, they're not interested. So that's what I think where, where uh, Chapter 12 and the discussion of motivation comes in, where you're collaboratively setting goals. Also, uh, Jackie Hinckley's chapter about combining different approaches, but I find that very challenging. Okay, great. Thank you for that. And we do have someone else wondering if this is just strictly appropriate for a graduate level student, clinician, or really what the audience is. Well, I think the audience is, in our minds anyway, the audience is, is any clinician who has ever asked him or herself, how do I deal with this? And, and, and that's what we're trying to, to answer, that these, these difficult, unusual kinds of approaches. And, and from our own background, Janet and mine, in, uh, in um, uh, teaching the students and, and looking at textbooks, uh, we know that a lot of these questions are not treated in detail in there. It might be mentioned, so certainly, for example, generalization may be mentioned in the textbooks, but, but they're not, it's not 
um, explained or, or treated in enough detail so that the clinicians know what to do. So in terms of, of, uh, of the target uh, uh, population, I think any, any clinician who's ever asked the question, and certainly the students uh, uh, that, uh, that could be uh, better informed about these details. And I, I understand, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a teacher myself. I, I don't have infinite time to cover everything in my classes. So, um, and I understand that, but, but these are important elements. Uh, generalization is important and treatment, treatment uh, uh, dosage is important. So uh, we're, we're tr just trying to, to fill that gap for anybody who, who does uh, aphasia therapy, really. Great, thank you. And Betty, do we have any questions on the line? There are no questions over the phone. Okay, well, those are the only two that we received via the chat. So I think at this point, I'm gonna wrap things up. I do wanna let everyone know that if you're interested in either requesting a review copy for a course or purchasing a copy for yourself, you can do that. Um, you can go to go.jblearning.com slash coppins. We also have a new speech language pathology and audiology faculty lounge on LinkedIn. Uh, we would love for everyone to join that as well. And you can find that at go.jblearning.com slash SLP LinkedIn. So at this point, I want to thank our presenters again, Janet and Patrick. That was a phenomenal presentation, very informative. And uh, thank you to everybody who joined. Thank you. Thank you very much.